Dinesh Kumar, Professor of Board and Master of Surgery. The topic is Transported Approach for Subcardinal Fraction. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'll try to you know, live up to the expectation after Madam's uh, great presentation. So, uh, today I'm going to present about the transportative approach because Condale has already been a topic of very great interest in us uh, simply because of the complexity of the uh, structure which is available. Uh, long back, you know, treating mandibular fractures by open reduction and external fixation has been the key. Uh, in oral and maxillofacial surgery because Condale always had great deliberations uh, because of the complexity of the anatomy and hence there will be more complications in the procedure which is performed. So this is just a breakup of the cases for the past 10 months we've been working hard on it. I have uh, put it mainly not to you know boast about the achievements of our department but uh, I would like to thank you all because our speciality is completely dependent on most of the people. I have always had very close rapport with oral medicine, oral pathology and orthodontics. It will be reflected there. And uh, when we did this particular surgery here, the condyle fractures, uh, I think uh, he is a beeper. No, he took a beautiful CBCT and gave of the condyle, uh, which is very helpful and uh, you know, uh, thanks to you. So we are always dependent on you guys. Guys can give you know, for more uh, uh, cases to us and so that we work better. So this is what we have done, all other general anesthesia, the postgraduates have got uh, uh, better exposure also in some of the cases where we have taken them to observe and assist as well, they started operating as well. Next slide. So the condylar fractures is quite common because you know, uh, it is quite slender at the neck, this is adult content and you get a pitch in the chin always. It is very important for dentists per se because you get trauma with loss of teeth in the mandibular anterior region. So whenever you see, uh, you will have a uh, laceration of the chin or somebody you know who complains of heat in the chin don't forget the contents so open or closed that is uh, going to be the debate and of course we favor the open method next one. so the etiology the pharmacokinetics that shows an excellent article in the clinics of north america you know why it has affected so far uh, we have seen so many condylar fractures which get we can get a proper occlusion by giving intramaxillary fixation you know but still when it is displaced it doesn't, you know, join with the other portion and then there are more incidences of jaw deviations and the internal derangement which is caused. This is uh, seen over a period of time only. There are so many articles we have proven that and this internal derangement is really a pain, you know. Next slide. And this is when to open. So that is, again, an article which quotes, you know, there have been so much of studies and come to a conclusion about the angulations, the gaps and other things which can help you to decide whether to open or not. Um, so this can be used in the lapse in treatment also. Suppose we do an open reduction and external fixation and then you take an x-ray and see there is a mild uh, you know, turning of the contact which is not perfectly as he was pre-operated. So 30% angulation difference is always acceptable, isn't it? Because the condyle remodel, remodels itself so beautifully. Next one. So why the transportative approach? One thing is for any treatment of a fracture, you need direct visualization of the fracture site. The whole concept of surgery is about incision and exposure. You get a very, very good exposure, you give a good treatment plan. And when you make an incision, try to avoid the anatomical structures which is uh, nearby. The parotid gland is the major structure which is creating big hindrance in this treatment, but that is the easiest area where you can operate. So you, you know about the various structures, you know, in the parotid gland. That causes the difficulty. Next one. So this is the picture showing the complexity, you know, about you got the, it forms a part of the temporomandibular joint, you got the arch, you got the tympanic plate on one side, stylomastoid, a styloid process on one side. That is very commonly, you know, when they get a hit on the chin, they say, I've got bleeding in the ear. A bleeding in the ear doesn't always cause a condylar fracture. But with the recent advances, advances with the CBCT and other things, we need not panic at all. You just take a CT or something, it shows precisely whether there is a fracture or not. But always, an injury may cause the internal dimension. You'll have to be, because the condyle, you got the disc above, you got the attachment of the lateral pterygoids, you know, on one portion of the disc, you get a clicking later on, you get, you know, the close click, 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 and other things are a big topic by itself. So the other picture shows you about the complexity of the structure. You got the external carotids because when you make the incision, the incision is supposed to be made about 0.5 centimeters 
uh, posterior to the posterior border of the mandible at about 0.5 centimeters below the ear lobule. If you deviate from this, you know, you make the incision 0.5 centimeters behind and then dissect and go anteriorly. There is a trick in it. You don't go there directly. If you go directly down, you got these structures which are just posterior. You got the external carotid artery, the related veins, you got the auriculotemporal nerve, you got the or greater auricular nerve. All these structures will play into role. And you go to above also, it's very tricky because what happens, the external carotid pierces through the parotid gland, isn't it? It goes through the parotid gland, goes up and divides to the maxillary artery and the superficial temporal artery. That is going to be there. You understand? And then the main trunk of the facial nerve is going to come through the sinus mastoid foramen, isn't it? You injure it, you're finished again. You got a complete paralysis of the face. Of course, we can use nerve stimulators also, but these surgical approaches are to be mastered, studied well, and then only done. No? So this is the complexity. There, that is why it is. You know, I wanted to show you how risky it is to do this procedure, but with an experienced hand, it is never an issue. Next slide. So this is a cross view of the transparotid approach. So you got the skin above, then the superficial fascia. And then you can have a bit of a platysma posterior, you'll have the stern, you'll have the sternal uh, and then the facial nerve within it. See, this condyle is lying below all these structures skin, subcutaneous tissue, then you got the uh, post radius now, just like that, they will answer, isn't it? The subcutaneous tissue, and finally the parotid gland. The parotid gland is covered by the parotid capsule. Parotid capsule is uh, formed by the investing in of deep surgical fascia and then the parotid gland is divided into the superficial and deep part by the masseter. Yeah, facial nerve also you can say, yeah, but actually it's by the masseter and facial nerve that is the venous plane of that, that facial venous plane. Uh, so you got the masseter below, isn't it? So in this, just below the capsule, what are the, what are the layers in which the structures come? It is nerve, vein and artery. First is the facial nerve. The facial nerve will come through the stylopastoid foramen, wind around the condyle of neck, go into the gland, then it divides into a complex plexus called as pes and sprinters, then it divides into two branches, which is the cervical facial and temporal facial branches. And then you know these five branches, I don't have to tell you that. If that is going to be affected, the facial palsy is one, is one thing. If you are going to nick the vessel, it is going to be another big issue. Isn't it? Unless you got some venous plexus, you can pack it and get away. Though we had a bleeding in that particular case, we could pack it and get away. That should have been a uh, venous bleed. So these are all the things which you will have to look at. Next slide. So this was the wonderful CBC. I think they had limitations in taking this, but still it was a fantastic. I came and met you, you know. You forgot. Uh, yeah, see, a lot, of, a lot of good things when you do, you forget uh, some of the things, isn't it? It is one such issue. I went and I spoke and it's very, really, really useful uh, in having such a fantastic picture. So this was a piece. This was actually a... High condylar fracture is going to be even more tougher. And then the next slide. So this is the incision design, you know, for our educational purpose. And usually we mark it, and the cross hatching is to, you know, provide the suturing properly. Uh, that is why. So initially you make the skin incision there. Next slide. So then we go for the dissection of the layers, we change, the, all these videos have problems. So you have the other layers below, so you just cannot bluntly cut through the layers. So, so we use skin hook retractors once you go through the first plane, and then subcutaneous tissue, a thin layer of muscle also will come, that is identified by the reddishness of the uh, tissue. Next slide. So careful enough to, you know, split. So the skin should have a layer of the subcutaneous tissue along with it. Then only you will get a good scar. I mean, a poor scar, I say. You don't get a, you know, it's quite aesthetically uh, very pleasing in case you have that. Next slide. So if you notice, I'm going anteriorly. That is how you go. And once you reach the corrupted capsule, that is the fascia which is there, then it is, you know, you incise it and all the way you make blunt dissection inside. So you try to separate. Why you do this blunt section? You see any structures? You can ligate it if you want. So the speciality of this surgical procedure is you go slow when it's required. In the end, you get you know. In the end, you finish it really quickly. In places you're not slow, you'll never finish the surgery. 
there is always, in most of the major surgeries which we do, there are some areas where we have to take great care. Next slide. So we use cartilage above the layer of the carotid gland, cartilage can be used because you are, that you are free of the nerve. So in advanced centers, once this is finished, you can change to the next one. Uh, once uh, in, in advanced centers, you know, it's not a very non affordable thing, you drop nerve stimulators. So you can go in and you know, uh, find out where these nerve branch, branches are. So this is a way to check I'm really on the target. In between, you, know, you can move the mandible and check whether you get a movement there, so that you're on the plane. There have been instances where people have strayed away from the anatomical landmark and go, gone totally underneath the mandible. And then they may even see the tube, and then, the, then the major vessels are going to come in. Now, if you go behind the plane, retromandibular vein is going to come, below that jugular vein is going to come. There are so many structures which are underneath that. So that fact, you can see, you will have, this is, this incision was quite longer in the earlier days and now it has become smaller and smaller because of aesthetic reasons. Then only you can, you know, the patient also accept, accepts this thing and now of late they have started even endoscopic surgeries with this so that it is totally just a keyhole and then you'll have to go in and probably do the plating perfectly. Next slide. So the corrective dissection is over. You bluntly dissect through the parotid gland in one area, parallel to the facial nerve. You, know, you can see the branches going on. Uh, what I felt usually is, and uh, then I've read in the articles also, the first two branches, no? uh, you, you can go between that, because they have a larger gap. The other branches are more closer, you tend to injure the nerve. The first phase, which I operated, I'll show a picture of the patient later on, uh, had a temporary paresis. And in a week's time, it went up. So I was really worried at that time. And after that, still now I've never got it. Next one. So finally, once you go in, the condyle is actually most of the times displaced anteromedially. Why is that? The condyle. Yeah. 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 Anything else? Lateral pterygoid is attached. Yeah. So if you look at the lateral pterygoid, you've got two a few origins. No. One is from the fossa. The other one is from the pterygoid plate, lateral surface. So if you keep the skull and the mandible and see, if the condyle breaks, this lateral pterygoid plate is on the inner side. You just pull it inside. That is why it is anteromedial. That is one of the indications, you know, based on angulation. Otherwise, if it lot of times, uh, not lot, some, some of the times it is displaced laterally. That is another indication for open reduction. You call it the Zeidenkin criteria. And uh, once you move the, pull the mandible down and you can pick it up. If it is a fresh trauma, you can pick it up, align it, and then hold, put the screws, you know. You'll have to be really guarding the undersurface of the condylar neck because what is the major structure which is there? Actually the artery. If you're going to make it in this closed thing, you're finished forever, you know. You just have to do a external carotid ligation, isn't, isn't it? So we should not, so that is why you should guard the underneath and probably lift the fragments up and then you can tell it. Next slide. And finally, when we do the closure, the closure has to be in layers, close the muscle, then close the fascia, then close the skin. If you don't close the fascia, what will happen? There is a parotid capsule. What is the complication which is going to come? Parotid gland is another major salivary gland. The saliva is going to come out. So you will have something called the silosy. In case you have got silosy, how will you check for it? Check for salivary amylase. You know, it will come. I have had uh, two instances of uh, this uh, salivary silosy. It will swell up, saliva is going to come, and then immediately identify and put a compression bandage on it for about a month's time, it heals. Otherwise, you have to do some other procedure which I will tell you. Thank you. Yeah. So, this is the picture that we got the reduction. Next slide. Yeah, this is one of the cases. Actually, this is the first case, I think in 2008. Uh, at the beginning of a career, a oral and maxillary patient surgeon will never tell that he is a beginner. Everybody says that, uh, you know, we do, we know everything. I was also one among them. And I survived for about two, three years with smaller procedures. Finally, this came, case came to the place where I was having my 
uh, workplace, okay, in a hospital. So I felt I can get away with the, the OPG is not, I mean, you can see that, how much displacement in a CT, just completely rotated actually. So I was trying to get away from this case by putting I am of the doctor there said, no, 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 this one you have to play. Well, at those times we used to operate in the night at about 11 o'clock or something. About 10 o'clock I went and told him, see, I don't know this procedure. Now I have seen this procedure. Um, but then I was compelled to operate and that is how I started. We were initially planning to put a KY right from the top with the help of both physician. But then somehow I had the guts to, you know, though I was prepared for it for about that, uh, one or two days, I could operate that. But it came out. But she only had a temporary paralysis in, initially. And then next slide. And that is the patient, you know. That is the scar. I made a wider incision in this because it was initial stages. Like really, and to be safer, if you see, I made it very anteriorly. It is not that pleasing if you see aesthetically, but with the age and the trauma, that doesn't matter. And this picture of her smiling all the way is because she has all the nerves functioning properly and she got a good doctor too. Next slide. So this is another patient. By this time, you know, this was the second bundle of fracture. I have already tried another bundle of fracture and failed and I closed it and escaped. You know, the symphysis of the bilateral, the boil separatus in the hospital had an issue. And I was worried when the saturation went down. Yeah. Otherwise, they would have to really take care of me rather than the patient. That was the first attempt, total failure. And then, but the patient doesn't know this now. He's still in touch with me. I met him in a place and still he thinks I really saved him. But that is the speciality of uh, surgery. But then the second one was a success. So the third one is going to be big success. No? Fantastic results, no issues. Yeah. By the time I had worked on my deficiencies, so next slide. So this is one, you can see the beautiful adaptation. Although all the time we, we may not get you know, such a good adaptation in, in case it's a little bit higher up. It doesn't pose an issue actually. Next slide. So these are the complications. Any surgical procedure will carry the risk of complications. You will have to be aware about it. And first of all, parotid gland, think of the nerve. So facial parotid. No, no, previous one. Uh, you should think about the facial palsy. If you cut the nerve, then you'll have to go for advanced procedures. Another one is infection all the time. Trauma, you've got a lot of you know, unwanted material inside, sand and other things sometimes. There's a direct injury, otherwise it's fine. And then a salivary fistula if you don't really find out that saliva is coming out. You know, in the initial stage, you will not find out. You just put a loose bandage, it will be just like that walking out. After a month, you say saliva is coming out, whenever I feel hungry. Then it is going to be another procedure which you have to do. So we have another article which I have quoted, and of course, Prey syndrome. Because parotid gland, as you know, no, it has the facial nerve inside, but it is supplied by the auricular temporal nerve and the great navicular nerve. The secretor motor fibers go through the glossopharyngeal nerve. So when there is a cross innervation, you get this Prey syndrome. And with scab wounds also, injuries also, you tend to get this thing. Next slide. So the cyanocele was one of the commonest complications, though it can be, so we published also this patient, this case, uh, a couple of years back, I guess. And then this patient, we cannot solve it. So we have to, what happens? The saliva is coming outside, it has to come inside, very simple. So you have to create a path of artificial drainage. It's going to be really big swelling, it will be very big. You put a 5 mm uh, white board needle, 5 cc, now it will fill up. It will fill saliva, clear of fluid. It will immediately go down. The patient will be very happy, but then it will come in the next. Uh, one or two hours so. So I put uh, the cannula inside and then brought it into the oral cavity and then the cannula later on we can remove because that will form a fistula inside. So the saliva drains inside because the duct, what is the duct of the parotid gland? Sensing yeah, sensing stack. That will come from the anterior portion of the parotid gland, it will go through the masseter and then vaccinate it, pierce inside the, like this, into the upper second, more or less, the addition of the anatomy. Even in trauma when you operate, don't make incisions as and when you please, you will cut all these fractures. So complications can also be avoided uh, if you really do a careful procedure. Next slide. So that should be all the references. I really didn't look at all kinds of the references and postgraduates might have put it. Thank you so much. Next slide. So